Lifting up Jesus, opening his word from Australia, Denmark, Israel, Japan, New Zealand, Northern Ireland, Republic of Ireland, Singapore, South Africa, United Kingdom, Thailand, the Philippines, United States, and throughout the world. You're watching Morial TV. Paul, first of all, speaks of tongues of angels and of men. Some scholars think he was speaking hyperbolically. Others are not sure if he was or he wasn't. When we look in the Old Testament and we see the divine apparitions taking place in heaven and the conversation that transpired with a Yeshua and Zerubbabel, not Jesus Yeshua, the other Yeshua, the high priest, in the book of Zechariah, we see that is recorded in Hebrew. While in the book of Revelation, it's recorded in Greek. Is that to say that the lingua franca in heaven changed from Hebrew to Greek? Or is it to say that it was an angelic tongue? It's very difficult to be dogmatic. Concerning the issue of is it for today, cessationism is an absolute wrong doctrine. There is nothing in scripture, nothing that supports the doctrine of cessationism. It is people distorting the scriptures out of context. When you get a letter from someone, you must consider everything stated in the letter in light of everything else in the letter. Well, Paul writes a letter, an epistle, to the church at Corinth. And in the opening chapters of the letter, he addresses the issues in brief that he's going to elaborate on further on in the letter, including the issue of charismata, charismatic gifts. And in 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 7, we read the following. We read that you may not be lacking in any charisma, any charismatic gift, okay, any charismatic gift that you may not be lacking in it, eagerly awaiting the revelation of our Lord Jesus Christ, the parousia, the coming of Jesus. In context, these gifts should continue to exist until Jesus comes. Now, the word there is apocalypsis, until the apocalypsis, the unveiling. Some have tried to suggest that means the book of Revelation, the apocalypse. However, that would be an absolute impossibility. When we look at Revelation chapter 1, verse 1, there's no definite article in the Greek. It just says apocalypsis, Jesu Christo. The revelation, or revelation, that is the unveiling of Jesus Christ, which God gave him to show to his bondservants the things which must soon take place. The apocalypse is not the book. The apocalypse are the things predicted in the book. It cannot, therefore, be a prophecy about the book of Revelation. Some have said that once the book of Revelation was written, there was no need for further charismatic gifts. Thus, the prophecy has no purpose, tongues have no purpose, etc., this is not possible linguistically or grammatically. The apocalypse or apocalypse is what's predicted in the book of Revelation. It's not the book itself. We're told directly in 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 7, that these gifts should not be lacking in the church until the coming of Jesus. Now, we're given later on in chapters 12 through 14 a list of what those gifts are, tongues being among them. There are many problems with tongues, however. The first thing we have to understand is this. It is a fulfillment of the prophecy of Isaiah chapter 28 and 29. Through people of strange lips or strange tongues, 
God will speak to this people. It was assigned to Jews on the day of Pentecost, a sign to Jews on the day of Pentecost, and it was obviously in discernible known human languages. Let's look at the first error. The first error that's often taught concerning tongues is that there is a difference or a distinction between the sign of tongues and the gift of tongues. There is not. There is not. There is no basis to say there's a difference between the sign of tongues and the gift of tongues. Nothing in Scripture supports that read in context. However, the second error we see is that everyone on the day of Pentecost prayed in a tongue. Let's look at the book of Acts, chapter 2, and look at the record narrative for itself. This was the Hebrew feast of Hag Shavuot, the Feast of Weeks, the Feast of Weeks, which Christians call Pentecost. There was an ingathering of Jews, and it has tremendous significance for the return of Christ as well as for what it meant for this particular time. And we read this. The people were all gathered there from all of these nations because it was one of the pilgrim feasts that had to be celebrated in Jerusalem. So Jews would come from all over the known world in order, of course, to, to observe it and to celebrate it scripturally. And we are told in an extended list the nations of which these people came from. In chapter 2, 8, if these men are all Galileans, how is it that we each hear them in our own language to which we were born? Parthians, which were Persian Jews, and Medes, which are Kurdish Jews, Elamites, residents of Mesopotamia, Judea and Cappadocia, Pontus in Asia, Phrygia, Pamphylia, Egypt, and the districts of Libya around Cyrene, visitors from Rome, both Jews and proselytes, Cretans from Crete, Arabs, etc., now let's look what we see, residents of Mesopotamia, Judea, and Cappadocia. The Judeans, we know for sure, spoke Aramaic. They spoke the Hebrew, de uh, Hebrew dialect of Aramaic. <coughs> this would have been the mother tongue of Jesus. Uh, the closest thing we have to what it was is something today called the Peshitta text, the Peshitta text. So the Jews of Galilee were speaking this particular language. They were speaking the Hebrew dialect of Aramaic, a Chalde language. So too the Jews of Judea were speaking the Hebrew dialect of Aramaic. They spoke the same language. Different accents. We have references in rabbinic history that they did not want Jews from Galilee to read the Torah in the synagogue or in the temple because they could not properly pronounce the difference between the Hebrew letters Aleph and Ein. Their accents sounded peculiar to the people in Jerusalem, but it was the same language. Therefore, based on the book of Acts, you cannot prove on the day of Pentecost that all of the people were speaking a different language other than their own. If the Judeans heard it in their own language, some of the Galileans, that is the 120 to 12 with Jesus, who had been his disciples, some of them must have also been speaking their mother tongue, which was simply Aramaic. You cannot prove they were all speaking another language. Thus the idea that you will speak in another language as proof of spirit baptism is implausible. It cannot be real. Uh, it's, it's, it's not a true doctrine, because on the day of Pentecost, some of them were obviously speaking their mother tongue. You can't prove they were speaking another language because the people in Judea uh, heard it. Well, that's if the local citizen around Jerusalem heard it. Well, let's continue further with this idea. We are told something concerning the next era associated with tongues. In 1 Corinthians chapter 14, we see the following. We see this in verse 22. So then tongues are assigned. Not to those who believe, but to unbelievers. But prophecy is a sign, not to unbelievers, but to those who believe. Therefore, if the whole church assembles together and all speak in tongues, and the ungifted men or unbelievers enter, will they not say that you are mad? 
But if all prophesy and an unbeliever or an ungifted man enters, he's convicted by all. He's called to account by all. The secrets of his heart are disclosed, and so he will fall on his face and worship God, declaring that God is certainly among you. The gifts of the Spirit occur as compound manifestations. Here we have a tongue, a prophecy, and a word of knowledge, a cognizance of something about a person personally that you could not have known by natural or intellectual means. So there's a word of knowledge, there's a prophecy, and a tongue. They're compound. Tongues plus interpretation becomes a form of prophecy. Interpreted tongues becomes a form of prophecy. That prophetic revelation may involve a word of knowledge, revealing something about an unsaved person, causing them to be convicted of their sin and to come to faith in Jesus. I had a personal instance in Israel quite a number of years ago. I spoke a single sentence in a language to a Jewish person that I did not understand, but they did. And it resulted in them getting saved because it was a word of knowledge about their background that I could not have known. I had not known this person very well at the time. This person accepted Jesus, Yeshua, as the Messiah, and is still walking with him more than 30 years later, faithfully. Uh, perfectly valid use of tongues. Jews seek a sign. It was a sign. It was a word of knowledge. They understood the language. I didn't. For tongues to build up the body of Christ, for tongues to be edifying to the body of Christ, it must be understood. Either in the way it was on the day of Pentecost, someone speaks a language they don't speak, or there's some kind of an interpretation. Um, then it can build up other people, either resulting in somebody being saved and the body having a prophecy being encouraged or whatever. However, if there is no comprehension of the tongue, if someone is simply speaking something that is mysterious in the spirit, as it were, that is to be done privately. Do not pray in tongues audibly unless the language is understood or unless there is an interpretation. It says when unsaved people come in and they hear everyone going on in tongues at once, they'll say you are crazy. They will say you are mad. One of the most disgusting, if not demonic, displays of this I've ever seen in my life was the video clip of Rodney Howard Brown, Kenneth Copeland, who's an absolute heretic, in tongues. It was absolutely atrocious. Unsaved people will say you are mad. In other words, the gifts of the Spirit, the charismatic gifts, are to be practiced in such a manner as the unsaved will be convicted and want to get saved, and the ungifted will want to get gifted. Now the term here for an ungifted person in Greek is interesting. It's idiotai, where we get the word idiot. It doesn't mean the same thing it does in modern English colloquially, but it does mean somebody who is idiotic in the sense that they don't know what they're talking about when it comes to the issue. Well, I've heard people like John MacArthur say things that are purely idiotic. He says things that are purely idiotic concerning cessationism in tongues, that they ended with the apostles and things like this. Now, his idiocy in the sense of 1 Corinthians 14 now goes even further. 
Although Corinthians says that these gifts should continue, we should not be lacking in them until the coming of Christ. We see in the book of Revelation, chapter uh, 12, verse 14, verses 13, 14, 11, 12, and 13. In the book of Revelation, chapter 14, verses 11, 12, 13, and 14, particularly verses 11 and 12. People who worship the Antichrist and take the mark of the beast will go to hell. The smoke of their torment goes up, and now tau and yones forever and ever. Yet we see John MacArthur, supported by Jimmy D. Young and defended by Phil Johnson. In regard to the latter half of the tribulation period, when, when men would be required to have the mark of the beast in order to buy or sell, my question is, uh, once a person takes the mark, is there any possibility of him coming to Christ? Yes. Uh, I think, you know, in, in the seven-year tribulation coming in the future, we're going to get into this so probably a week from Sunday night, maybe this Sunday night, maybe a week, I'm not sure. But um, the tribulation is a seven-year period, right? The rapture of the church, seven-year tribulation, then Christ returns, sets up his kingdom. Now, in that seven-year period, really two things happen. God begins to judge the world. In, with a series of holocausts and at the same time he begins to redeem his people Israel and in the process of this the Antichrist establishes his rule and in order to function in the economy of the Antichrist you have to take the mark of the beast uh, the mark being the number of a man Revelation 13 666 6 is the number of man right seven is the number of perfection and man always falls short of perfection six 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 always six is never seven so the number of a man and apparently what's going to happen you take the mark on your hand or on your forehead and we've talked a lot about that, you know, that uh, that that's kind of the computer situation. We're now moving fast toward the time when we're going to have to do everything we do by cards and by numbers and all of that. And uh, uh, those numbers, the thing about a card that's a problem is you lose it, and they've already devised systems to put the number on your hand and on your forehead. And you go through a scanner, and then you know that's how you buy and sell. It's automatically deducted from your bank account. Now the question is, if you're living in the tribulation period. And you take this mark. In other words, you identify with the beast's empire. Will you still be able to be redeemed? And I think the answer to that is yes. Uh, defending idiocy. To say you can take the mark of the beast, worship Satan in the person of the Antichrist, and still be saved in direct rejection of what is plainly stated in Revelation chapter 14, verses 11 and 12. This is pure idiocy. So, when you see John MacArthur talking about cessationism and the gifts of the Spirit ending, he's speaking idiocy. But he takes that idiocy further and re reveals the idiocy of his false theology by saying people can worship Antichrist, take the mark of the beast and still go to heaven. This is idiocy. This is John MacArthur's teaching. It's idiocy. It is as idiotic on one extreme as hyper-Pentecostalism is on the other. Hyper-Pentecostalism being that there's a distinction between tongues as a gift and tongues as a sign. And that if you don't pray in tongues, you're not baptized in the Spirit. Or in some extreme cases, some sects teach you're not even saved. That's pure idiocy. On the other extreme is John MacArthur. That's pure idiocy. And, 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 and his colleagues, uh, R.C. Sproul and these people, they're teaching idiocy. They're teaching idiocy. How can you say John MacArthur is teaching idiocy? Anybody who says that you can take the mark of the beast and worship the Antichrist is teaching idiocy. It's not only false teaching, it's idiotic. Well, what he says about tongues having ended with the apostles, or the charismatic gifts having ended with the apostles, is co-equally idiotic. It's like so many other issues. It's the extremists who polarize everyone else. It's the hyper-charismatic extremists, the lunatic fringe, who are experiential in their theology, who are confusing emotionalism with spirituality, who are imagining gibberish to be real tongues, authentic tongues, who are basically confusing prophecy with what amounts to nothing more than clairvoyance, who think it's a revelation of the Spirit when it's nothing more than what Jeremiah calls in chapter 23, the futility and deception of their own mind. That's idiocy. All of that stuff is idiocy. But cessationism on the other extreme is also idiocy. The hatchet job exegesis of 
1 Corinthians 13 that they engage in, the so-called love chapter, trying to make, as it were, love and tongues as or, or charismatic gifts as mutually exclusive is ridiculous. Oh, the perfect is come. We no longer need tongues. The perfect is the New Testament canon. Well, read right in the context of the epistle, the perfect is the coming of Christ when the bride is perfected. If the perfect is come, we no longer need faith or hope either, only love, only charity. If the perfect has come, we no longer need faith and we no longer need hope. The perfect has come, read in context. But the perfect has not yet come. Therefore, the Lord tells us we need faith and we need hope. And he also tells us, until that perfect comes, until Jesus returns, we should not be lacking in any good charismatic gift. They should not be lacking from the body of Christ. Now, because these gifts are counterfeited, that does not mean we should reject what's authentic and real and scriptural as from the Lord. Again, the old absurd analogy, take your money out of your pocket and put a match to it simply because this counterfeit is making counterfeit money, so get rid of the real money. It's crazy. Well, it's the same idea. Paul uses the word idiocy. Both hyper-Pentecostal and charismatic extremism is scripturally defined as idiocy. If the unsaved or ungifted enter and see this charismania, and the theological term for charismania is neo-Montanism, neo-Montanism. If they enter and see this charismania, they'll say you are mad. But when I see the idiocy of John MacArthur and R.C. Sproul and Philip Johnson and Jimmy DeYoung, pure idiocy, saying that these gifts ended with the apostles, the perfect has come. Well, if the perfect has come, you no longer need faith and you no longer need hope. But we're saved by grace through faith, so you can't get saved without faith. We don't have a blessed hope because the perfect has already come. It's like saying Christ has come already. And then their idiocy becomes further demonstrated when they say you can take the mark of the beast, worship the Antichrist, worship Satan and the person of the Antichrist, and still be saved and go to heaven. It's all idiocy. Don't listen to idiots. I am willing to publicly debate John MacArthur in front of the video camera and publicly accuse him of theological idiocy for his cessationism. His idiocy is no less idiotic than the hyper-charismatics who are telling people if they don't pray in tongues, they're not saved, if they haven't spoken in tongues, they're not spirit-baptized. <clears throat> Idiot and idiocy and idiotic are strong terms. But they're not my terms. They're the terms the Holy Spirit has inspired to be included in the canon of God's Word. Yes, tongues still exist. We cannot be dogmatic that there's no tongues of angels. But most of what you see today, most of what is called tongues today, is probably not even real. This, however, is not to deny what is scripturally authentic and inspired of God's Spirit. My name is Jacob Prash. Thank you so much for your question. God bless.